Hard to believe, folks, but this is the 16th hour of broadcasting in our series on Mystery Babylon. You're listening to The Hour of the Time, and I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, what you have just listened to is a warning. Is a warning. For there is a war being conducted right at this moment a war against the American people. It is now a shooting war and the second battle is being fought. The first was fought in the state of Idaho against the family of Randy Weaver. The second battle is being fought by a brave group of men and women and children in a church known as Branch Davidian in Waco, Texas. They are fighting for their creator endowed rights. They have committed no crimes. They know what the sound of battle is. They know what it's like to see their friends or relatives die in their arms or at their feet they know what it's like to have wounded and be refused medicine and medical treatment. Oh, yes. We are at war. Make no mistake about it. And if you don't believe that, you keep your eyes and ears open in the next weeks, months, and years, you will see it escalate across this country like a wild forest fire out of control. And unless the sheeple wake up and listen and learn and act, I predict that there will be civil war in the United States of America because there are many of us who will not ever give up our creator-endowed rights, our right to keep and bear arms, the Constitution of the United States, and the Bill of Rights, without one hell of a fight. And what you heard at the beginning of this program, folks, for those of you who have never experienced war, was the real sounds of war. What you heard were real bullets being fired, real bombs being dropped, real machine guns killing real people. And taps at the end was a real bugle blowing real taps over real graves of real fallen men who were buried in Arlington National Cemetery. You see, many people have already died protecting what many of you are giving up. I, for one, will not. When they come for me, there will be another battle. I will not give up. And I don't care who wins or loses because at the end of my battle it will be just the beginning of yours. 
Do you understand what I'm telling you? You see, my whole purpose is to wake enough people so that no battles ever have to be fought, but we're already behind because two have already been fought, and more, I guarantee you, are on the way. Guaranteed, folks. Guaranteed. Because the more we allow them to get away with, the more they will attempt. I don't want a civil war in this country. I want to stop it before it even has a chance to start. And the only way to do that is wake up America. You see, if 200 million people stand up with their right under the second article and amendment to the Constitution, holding a weapon in their hand, and say, enough, we will not put up with this anymore, stop it now, get out of our government, get out of our cities, get out of our military and stay out, that will be the end of it and no shot will ever have to be fired. I guarantee that. But what do you think the odds are of that happening? Well, it's time, folks, to talk about our sponsor, Swiss American Trading Corporation. Now, if you've followed my broadcast for any length of time, you know that I've been bringing you this show, The Hour of the Time, mostly without sponsorship. In part, I've been very leery of allowing just any corporation or any business to buy time on my show, and my requirements are very strict. I'm proud, folks, very proud to announce a new alliance. Swiss America Trading Corporation and myself are committed to preparing my listening audience for the upcoming economic trauma. Many of you have asked me, what can I do to save my assets? What can I do to protect myself against the economic collapse that's coming? Well, folks, for over 11 years, Swiss America has been supplying over 10,000 clients with hard assets and constant information on how best to protect those assets. And for a limited time, interested listeners can receive a complimentary newsletter. If you mention my name, William Cooper, the hour of the time, and ask for the information on protecting your future. It's called Protecting Your Future. So call, folks. Call this number. Write it down right now. You should always have a pen and paper with you when you listen to this broadcast. You know that. Write this down. 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Let me say it one more time for you. one 800 289-2646. Invest the time it takes, folks, to read one of the most important publications of our times. Call 1-800-289-2646. Swiss American Trading Corporation, they have all of the investments that we have recommended on previous broadcasts, and they have many more. Some we don't recommend, but it's up to you to choose. They're a reputable company. We've thoroughly checked them out. We have talked to their clients, their customers. We've checked their background. We've checked with law enforcement agencies. And I'm telling you right now, these people will treat you right. If they don't, you call me and let me know immediately. Now, this is the 16th hour of our series on Mystery Babylon. Many of you have already made the necessary connections. You know what's happening, and you know who's bringing it about, and you know why. Some of you still do not. So we will continue. Manly P. Hall wrote this. Quote, the serpent kings, and notice that Mr. Hall capitalized the two words as one would do for a deity or for royalty, when he wrote this, reigned over the earth. 
The serpent kings reigned over the earth. It was these serpent kings who founded the mystery schools, which later appeared as the Egyptian and Brahmin mysteries. The serpent was their symbol. They were the true sons of light. And from them have descended a long line of adepts and initiates duly tried and proven according to the law, unquote. And the proper term is not Freemason, it's Free Messan. It comes from the French, from the Knights Templar, and it literally means the Sons of Light. Another writer, Wilfred Gregson, informed his readers why Mr. Hall capitalized the two words Serpent Kings when he wrote, Quote, one symbol of great prominence throughout all ancient civilizations is the snake or serpent, where it has symbolized divine wisdom. Unquote. So Mr. Hall had reason to capitalize the words because he had discovered that the serpent represented divinity. Notice also, folks, that Mr. Gregson, even though he chose not to capitalize the word serpent, confirmed that Mr. Hall's use of the capital letter was correct when he stated that there was a connection between divine wisdom and the serpent. Mr. Hall, a 33rd degree mason, made the same connection in these comments. Quote, the serpent is true to the principles of wisdom, for it tempts man to the knowledge of himself. Unquote. A serpent is often used by the ancients to symbolize wisdom. The symbol of the serpent has another concealed truth, according to Kenneth Mackenzie, for he identified that truth in this quote when he described a brazen serpent. Quote, it was a type of mediator and a promise of redemption. Unquote. The word brazen, folks, is defined as bold or impudent, and impudent is defined as shamelessly bold or disrespectful. Now, you will remember that Lucifer was an anointed cherub in heaven who fell because he sought godly power. The story is covered in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 14 of the Old Testament. Look it up. It says this, quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will be like the Most High. Unquote. Therefore it can be safely said that Lucifer would be considered to be shamelessly bold and, of course, disrespectful. It appears that the brazen serpent could be Lucifer. Another author, John Anthony West, wrote a book entitled Serpent in the Sky, in which he also connected the serpent with wisdom, and he wrote this, quote, The serpent represents intellect, the faculty by which man discriminates. There is a higher and a lower intellect. Thus, symbolically, there is a serpent that crawls, and the higher intellect, that which allows man to know God, the heavenly serpent, the serpent in the sky. Unquote. The somewhat veiled worship of this serpent in the sky inside the Masonic lodges was alluded to by another Masonic writer, Kenneth Mackenzie, for in his book entitled The Royal Masonic Cyclopedia, he wrote this, quote, among the charges preferred against the Order of Knights Templar for which Jacques de Molay suffered martyrdom was that of worshipping an idol or image called Baphomet. It has been suggested that Baphomet is none other than the Ancient of Days or Creator. More cannot be said here without improperly revealing what we, meaning the Masons, are bound to heal, conceal, and never reveal." Unquote. So according to this mason, the snake or serpent is somehow a symbol of the subject of the Masonic worship, and apparently this fact is the secret that the masons cannot reveal to the rest of the world. A Christian minister, Reverend Alexander Hislop, wrote a book that included some discussion on the subject of serpent worship. And in that book, entitled Two Babylons, he explained that serpent worship was not something that is recent in time. It was an ancient practice. 
Quote, Along with the sun, this symbol will be discussed later, as the great fire god, and in due time identified with him, was the serpent worshipped. In the mythology of the primitive world, the serpent is universally the symbol of the sun. As the sun was the great enlightener of the physical world, so the serpent was held to have been the great enlightener of the spiritual by giving mankind the knowledge of good and evil, unquote. And according to the Bible, you know who gave man the knowledge of good and evil? Satan, Lucifer. He then discussed a coin minute in, in Tyre, the center of the ancient Phoenician culture. This coin was also the subject of an article in the September 1986 issue of the Good News magazine. It depicted a serpent entwined around a tree stump. To the left of the stump stood an empty cornucopia, and to the right a flourishing palm tree. The snake on the coin is the symbol of the powerful god whom the Romans called Esculapius. The name means the man instructing snake or the snake that instructs man. And the article then reported, quote, In mythology, Esculapius was believed to be the child of the sun and thus the enlightener of mankind. As the legend goes, Esculapius was ultimately struck down by a thunderbolt thrown by an angry Zeus, king of the gods, and cast into the underworld. Unquote. The tree stump, folks, represented the fallen god and his ruined kingdom. In the mythologies of many ancient civilizations, the image of a fallen tree was used to symbolize the cutting off of a great god or hero, someone cut off in the midst of of their power. You see, the snake on the coin was shown twisting itself around the dead stump, exerting its power in an attempt to restore his fallen kingdom. The cornucopia is an ancient symbol of plenty, but it was empty on the coin. And this has been interpreted as meaning that the abundance had been cut off because the great God has been cut off. However, Folks, the implication is that the horn of plenty will return when the fallen god is restored to his rightful position. The palm tree shown in the coin is a well-known symbol of victory. So it appears that the coin was minted to depict the anticipated return of the fallen snake god to the world. And the Bible talks about a fallen serpent in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9. However, in this case, folks, the snake is connected to another symbol of the serpent, a great dragon. Quote, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, unquote. Is the serpent worshipped in the ancient mysteries and a symbol in the Masonic ceremonies, a symbol of Satan, the devil? As has already been discussed, there is indeed evidence, folks, that this is the case. And once you have confronted the evidence and studied as much as I have studied, you will know that they are one and the same. Another symbol that needs to be analyzed is the star. On the page opposite page 124 in Mackey's Encyclopedia is a drawing il illustrating the symbols of Freemasonry. Included in the 20 or so Masonic symbols is a drawing of a shooting star. Now it can be fairly claimed that a blazing or shooting star would be one that was on the move inside the universe. One of the directions it could move would be, of course, towards the Earth. If it was moving towards the Earth, it could be called a falling star. But we know that most falling stars are actually meteors and not stars at all. Lucifer, however, is a fallen angel, according to Isaiah, an Old Testament prophet who wrote this in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Quote, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? Unquote. Now, folks, notice that Isaiah also said that Lucifer fell from heaven, and other parts of the Bible report that he fell to the earth. 
so it is conceivable that the symbol of the falling or blazing star could be a symbol of Lucifer. A variety of authors have used their writings to discuss the star as a symbol. Professor Adam Weishaupt, the founder of the Bavarian Illuminati, was one who explained what he considered the star to be a symbol of. <laughs> Listen closely. Quote, The flaming star is the torch of reason, unquote. Mr. Mackey wrote that the star, quote, was a symbol of God, unquote. He then connected the blazing star to another symbol when he wrote, quote, the blazing star refers us to the sun, unquote. And then he connected it with the secret initiation ceremonies inside the Masonic Lodge. Quote, in the fourth degree of the same rite, the Scottish rite of Freemasonry, the blazing star is again said to be a symbol of the light of divine providence pointing out the way of truth, unquote. And Mr. Hutchins, the Masonic writer who has authored the recent book on Masonry, further interpreted the symbol of the star thusly. Quote, the star as a type of the myriad suns that light other countless systems of worlds is an emblem of that Masonic light in search of which every Mason travels, the correct knowledge of the deity and of his laws that control the universe." Unquote. Now closely allied with the symbol of the star is the symbol of the sun. Albert Pike identified it with the worship of the past in this collection of quotes from his writings and pay close attention quote the worship of the sun became the basis of all the religions of antiquity unquote quote thousands of years ago men worshiped the sun originally they looked beyond the orb to the invisible god they personified him as brahma amun osiris baal adonis malkarth mithras and Apollo, Krishna, is the Hindu sun god, unquote. Quote, the Gauls worshipped the sun under the name of Belen, or Belenis, unquote. Quote, the sun is the ancient symbol of the life-giving and generative power of the deity. The sun was his manifestation and visible image, unquote. Quote, the sun is the hieroglyphical sign of truth because it is the source of light, unquote. So Mr. Pike identified the sun as a symbol of a deity that should be worshipped. He chose to capitalize the first letter in the word, the S, as one would in recognizing the name of a deity. And if you've been listening to this series, you already know that, of course, it was. Albert Mackey repeated Mr. Pike's contentions with comments like these about sun worship. Quote, It was the oldest and by far the most prevalent of all the ancient religions. Eusebius says that the Phoenicians and the Egyptians were the first who ascribed divinity to the sun. Hardly any of the symbols of masonry are more important in their signification, are more extensive in their application, than the sun as the source of material light. It minds the mason of that intellectual light of which he is in constant search. The sun is then presented to us in masonry, first as a symbol of light, but then more emphatically as a symbol of sovereign authority. Unquote. So, folks, the sun was a symbol of something that only the believers in the religion known as the ancient mysteries understood. These believers, called adepts, certainly knew that the people would not accept their mystery religion, so they had to conceal it from them. Don't go away, folks. We've got to take a short break. I'll be right back after this pause. So the task became one of creating a religion around a belief that they knew the people would accept because it would make some sense, at least as far as the adepts would explain it but their basic purpose, was to create a popular religion as a cover for their secret worship. The secret religion would be built around a belief in the sun. The sun would be a perfect thing to build a religion around because of its basic nature. It is very visible and has a very important role in man's life. It rises in the morning. It appears to be born and then sets during the evening. It appears to die, and then appears to be born again the next morning. 
It also appears to wander in the sky, setting further north or south each night. It then returns back to any given position twice each year. So the sun appears to have a major birth or death twice each day and twice each year. It would, of course, be very easy for the adepts to explain to the people that only something bigger than mankind, a god, had the ability to die and come back to life. So the adepts would teach the people that they had to pray to the god, or it would choose not to return. They encouraged a worship of the sun so that it would return to mankind again either once a day or once every six months. Albert Pike confirmed this view with this explanation of why early man worshipped the sun. Quote, to them, meaning early man, the journeyings of the sun were voluntary and not mechanical. Unquote. So early man considered the sun to be something that moved voluntarily. In other words, the sun did not have to return each morning. Man must have quickly determined that since the sun did not have to return, man should start asking it to return. For man certainly depended upon the sun for his life. Man certainly must have figured out just how important the sun was to his life and well-being, and he certainly must have determined that if the sun chose not to return, all of mankind would certainly perish. So it was an easy jump from a belief that the necessary sun was an entity that chose to move across the daytime sky to a belief that it would return only if man prayed to it to return. But folks, there's something even more interesting to be considered that Pike didn't explain with that comment. Obviously, to make the new religion work, the believers would have to be able to predict the movements of the sun. It wouldn't be too long before some of the common people would start noticing that the sun was neither an actual being nor a god to be worshipped, but something that moved according to precise laws. Now, if the common people figured that out, they would not need the adepts who had computed the sun's periodic cycles. So, to keep their power intact, they would teach the people that if they did not accommodate their wishes, they would make certain that the sun did not return. They could even predict, as their measurements became more sophisticated, the exact time and date when the moon would go between the sun and the earth, causing the sun to disappear. They could then fool the people into believing that they were the cause of the disappearance. They could then, of course, explain to the people that if they did not continue to pay them sort of tribute, they would not intercede in their behalf, and the sun would not reappear. To keep the minds of the common people, the sheeple, away from figuring out that the whole religion was a scam, the adepts would conduct beautiful and ornate ceremonies around the worship of the sun, and they would expect the people to pay them for the elaborate rituals. And to make their rituals valid, the adepts would always claim that the sun obeyed their prayers, thereby convincing the people of their need to keep the adepts around. The people, I mean the sheeple, would continue to pay tribute to these adepts as long as as they appeared to be successful. Now, folks, if the adepts knew that the sun was a symbol of something that the people would not support, such as a belief that Lucifer, the devil, was the god that they worshipped, they would have to continue with their charade so that the people would not decide to stop worshipping. Because if the sheeple figured it out, they would no longer support their activities. They would have to keep their beliefs from the people and conceal their secret worship in hidden symbols. So sun worship as a religion prospered. Mr. Hutchins discussed that position in his book, and I also discussed it in mine, Behold a Pale Horse. Mr. Hutchins says this, quote, In the tabernacle, the brethren, clothed in black, mourn Osiris, who is representative of the sun, of light, of life of good and beauty, 
They reflect upon the way the earth may again be gladdened by his presence, unquote. Mr. Pike connected the son to Osiris, mentioned by Mr. Hutchins as worthy of being mourned. Quote, the three lights at the altar inside the Masonic temple represent Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Osiris was represented by the sun, unquote. Mr. Mackey went a little further and informed his readers that, quote, Osiris was the sun, unquote. In his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Carl H. Cloudy, the author, himself a Mason, connected the sun worship with the ceremonies inside the Masonic Lodge. Quote, the Lodge sets him, meaning the initiate, upon the path that leads to light, but it is for him to travel the winding path to the symbolic east. Unquote. The physical sun rises in the east and the Masons explain that their search for light begins in the East, and notice that Mr. Cloudy capitalizes the word East, apparently in reverence to the spot where they believe that this God resides. The Masons tell the world that they circumambulate, defined as walking around, the temple floor during their initiation ceremonies. Mr. Cloudy explains why this rite is performed. Quote, when the candidate first circles the lodge room about the altar, he walks step by step with a thousand shades of men who have thus worshipped the Most High by humble imitation. Thus thought of circumambulation is no longer a mere parade, but a ceremony of significance linking all who take part in it with the spiritual aspirations of a dim and distant past, unquote. And it is a historical fact that the Knights Templar also performed the circumambulation of their temples. And he further instructs his readers as to why this ceremony is part of their ceremony. Quote, Early man circled altars on which burned the fire which was his god from east to west by way of the south. Notice that the north is not included in the ceremony. The significance of that omission will be discussed later. But circumambulation became a part of all religious observances, unquote. In another part of his book, entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, Mr. Cloudy reported that this style of walking was traceable to the ancient religions of the past. And he wrote this, quote, Circumambulation was the ceremonies of ancient Egypt, unquote. So this practice of the modern Masons is based upon the ancient pagan religious practices of the ancients. So the Masons are telling us that early man walked around in a circle because he was worshipping the sun. Then they tell us that they are doing it for the same reason. There are reasons that the north as a location to be visited in their walk around the temple floor is not included in their initiation rites. And six of the great Masonic writers have told us why this is so. Captain William Morgan offered his readers this explanation with this comment from his book, the writing of which he was murdered for. Quote, we therefore masonically term the North a place of darkness, unquote. Mr. Mackey confirmed that statement in his book. Quote, the North is masonically called a place of darkness. And Mr. Pike confirmed the comments made by the other two Masons with this declaration. Quote, to all Masons, the North has immediately been the place of darkness, and of the great lights of the Lodge, none is in the North. Unquote. And Kenneth Mackenzie added his confirming thoughts. Quote, the North was always esteemed a place of darkness. Unquote. Mr. Hutchins became the fifth Masonic writer to confirm this detail. As he said this, quote, as in other degrees, the closing ritual provides a summary of the lessons taught in the degree. We hear in the West the eagles gather and the doom of tyranny is near. In the South, truth struggles against error and oppression. In the North, fanaticism and intolerance won. In the East, the people begin to know their rights and to be conscious of their dignity and that the sun's rays will soon smite the summits of the mountains. Unquote. Mr. Hutchins informed his readers that the North was where fanaticism and intolerance resided. 
What he meant by this, and what the symbol of the north represents, will be explored later. And the sixth Masonic writer who confirmed that the north was a place of darkness was Carl Cloudy, who wrote in his book entitled Introduction to Freemasonry, quote, the place of darkness, the north, unquote. And the reason the Masons do not include the North in their rites is found in the Bible. In the Bible. The reason the Masons do not include the North in their rites is found in the Bible. In Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 13. Quote, I, meaning Lucifer, will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the North. Unquote. The God of the Bible sits in the north, and Lucifer hopes one day to acquire the throne of God for his throne. But until then, the north is a place of darkness. But while the north is an excluded territory, the east is the place of light and is to be revered, Mr. Hutchins tells his readers why that is so. Quote, the east, the source of light and thus knowledge, unquote. Albert Mackey quotes Etienne Francois Bazat, a French Masonic writer, in his encyclopedia. Quote, the veneration which the Masons have for the East bears a relation to the primitive religion whose first degeneration was sun worship. Unquote. Rex Hutchins then tells his readers that the Masons deploy lights around the lodge room during the initiation ceremony for the 25th degree called the Night of the Sun, and he writes, quote, the ceiling should be decorated to represent the heavens with the moon, the principal planets and the constellations Taurus and Orion, a single powerful light, a great globe of glass representing the sun is in the south. In a physical sense, the greater light comes from the sun, and the transparencies provide lesser light. Symbolically, the sun or great light is the truth, and the lesser lights are man's symbolic representation of truth." Unquote. Mr. Mackey further discusses this rite of circumambulation, as he calls it, in his encyclopedia. He says that the rite, quote, exists in Freemasonry. The people always walked three times round the altar while singing a sacred hymn. In making this procession, great care was taken to move in imitation of the course of the sun, unquote. He then assisted the reader with understanding this practice in the Masonic temples. Quote, this rite of circumambulation undoubtedly refers to the doctrine of sun worship, unquote. However, in another of the books that he wrote, Mr. Mackey directly states that the rite is connected to sun worship. This is what he wrote in a book entitled Manual of the Lodge. Quote, the circumambulation among the pagan nations referred to the great doctrines of Sabaism or sun worship, unquote. Sabaism is defined by Mr. Mackey in his encyclopedia as, quote, Sabaism, the worship of the sun, moon, and stars, the host of heaven. It was practiced in Persia, Chaldea, India, and other Oriental countries at an early period in the world's history, unquote. He then added this rather cryptic comment, quote, and although the dogma of sun worship does not, of course, exist in Freemasonry, we find an allusion to it in the rite of circumambulation, which it preserves, unquote. Now, one can understand what Mr. Mackey meant by that comment. The Masons do not worship the sun. They worship the sun, <laughs> with a capital S. So he was telling the truth, but concealing it in a symbolic language, for he wrote sun with a small s. You have to understand the symbology of the mystery schools, or you will never understand anything, dear listeners. Mr. Hutchins then volunteered the information that in the twelfth of the thirty-two degrees, the rite of circumambulation is preserved, and he writes, quote, in all the Scottish Rite degrees thus far, the candidate has made 21 prescribed circuits around the altar. This degree adds 7 for a total of 28. And this practice, called circumambulation, is derived from the ancients and existed among the Romans, Semites, Hindus, and others. It is thought to have been a rite of purification. 
The sun was believed to travel around the earth. The initiates imitated the movement of the sun when they made circuits around the altar, unquote. Furthermore, dear listeners, in the ninth degree, other symbols of the sun are involved in the ceremony, and Mr. Hutchins tells his readers, quote, After the obligation is taken, the nine candles of yellow wax are lit. Yellow is representative of the sun, hence light and knowledge. In the tenth degree, further symbols representing the sun are utilized according to this author. Quote, there are three sets of five lights. The wax is yellow, meaning knowledge, and also as the color of the sun represents the deity. Unquote. A blatant admission that the sun represents the deity that they worship. Other clues that the sun and the serpent are both known symbols of the Masonic Lodge are given by the titles of two of the 32nd degrees inside the Masonic Lodge. The 25th degree initiate is called a Knight of the Brazen Serpent, and the 28th degree initiate is called a Knight of the Sun, with a capital S. There is another symbol of the sun inside the Masonic Lodge, the Worshipful Master. The equivalent of the president of the lodge sits in the east side of the temple, and we are told why that is. Quote, the worshipful master represents the sun at its rising. The senior warden, another officer of the lodge, represents the sun at its setting. And the junior warden, still another officer of the lodge, represents the sun at meridian, the halfway point, the most high. Other individuals and organizations besides the Masonic Lodges are also involved, folks, in various varying degrees with sun worship, or with an acknowledgement that the sun plays a central role in their understanding of the nature of the world. Elizabeth Clare Prophet has been described as being a leader in the New Age movement, and she has written this in a newsletter she publishes called The Coming Revolution. Quote, the healing of the nations begins with the healing of ourselves. We must draw forth from the great central sun that eternal light with which we were anointed from the beginning, unquote. Adolf Hitler, I'm sure you've heard of him, the head of the German government prior to and during World War II and who was directly responsible for the murder of over 50 million people, was also a sun worshiper. Very early in his life, he joined a secret organization called the Thule Society. And 40 years after the war, some historians are finally delving into its strange beliefs. Two of these writers, Michael Bertrand and Jean Angelini, have produced a book entitled The Occult and the Third Reich. And one of their conclusions is, quote, In the Nazi cosmology, the sun played a prime role. As a sacred symbol of the Aryans, in contrast to the feminine and magical symbolism of the moon, revered by the Semitic peoples, unquote. The Nazi Party was the name of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the party that Mr. Hitler joined. It became the controlling party of the German government prior to and during the war. The Fuhrer, German for leader in this case, meaning Mr. Hitler, saw in the Jewish people with their black hair and swarthy complexion the dark side of the human species, while the blonde and blue-eyed Aryans constituted the light side of humanity. Hitler undertook to extirpate, meaning to eliminate, from the material world its impure elements to lead it back to glory. But sun worship, as the Masons point out, is not new. The Bible talks about it as well. Folks, Ezekiel was an Old World Testament prophet writing sometime during the period of 571 to 592 B.C. And he tells about how he was taken by God to see a practice occurring near the temple. And this is what he wrote in Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. Quote, and he, the Lord God, brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, 
were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. Unquote. And Ezekiel points out that the Lord God considered this practice an abomination. There is another reference to sun worship in the Old Testament, this time in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 2 through 4, and then verse 7. And that reference reads as follows. Quote, If there be found among you, man or woman, that hath gone and served other gods, and worshipped then, either the sun or moon, or any of the host of heaven, and it be true that such an abomination is wrought in Israel, so thou shalt put the evil away from among you, Unquote. So, folks, the God of the Bible has made it perfectly clear that sun worship is something that he does not want. He does not want his creatures practicing this. The Bible even went so far as to say in both instances that he considered the practice to be an abomination or an evil. But to show just how far this practice has invaded the Christian community, the following prayer was offered up at a recent funeral in a local Christian church. Quote, now you will feel no rain, for your mother, the earth, will fold her arms around you. Now you will feel no cold, for your father, the sun, will always warm you. Unquote. Sun worship continues. Because some Christian churches pray to the sun god in their church services and don't understand who they are praying to. Simply stated, simply stated, dear listeners, the sun god that they were praying to is Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan or the devil. Wakes you up, doesn't it? See, all the time you thought religion was something... Stupid. Didn't have anything to do with overall world events, but you're wrong. Has everything to do with everything. Whether you believe it or not, whether I believe it or not, doesn't make any difference. If the people who have the power and are in control believe it, it will affect us all. Understand that. Because that's true. It's time, folks, to talk once again about Swiss America Trading Corporation. It is the only... <laughs> it is the only corporation that I recommend. Good night, and God bless each and every one of you.